Welcome to day 23 of the 2023 Advent of Code. So for today's problem, we're going for a walk through a, a bunch of hiking trails. And so we have a grid with paths indicated by dots, forest indicated by uh, pound signs, and slopes indicated by the four V-shaped symbols. We're currently on the single path tile in the top row, and we're trying to get to the single path tile in the bottom row. Because of the mist, the slopes are probably pretty icy, so if we step onto a slope, the next step must be downhill. So basically, each time we go onto one of these, we must go to the one that's pointed to it next. We also need to make sure we never step on the same tile twice to ensure we have the most scenic hike possible. Given these constraints, what's the longest hike that we can take? So. One observation that we can make, and this is not strictly necessary for the solution to work, it's just necessary for the solution to be efficient, is that we have a maze-like structure where the path is always exactly one wide. So basically, we will never have two adjacent paths. So we'll never have, let's say, a situation where we have these cells all as open paths right next to each other. And so what this tells us is that basically for most of our walking, we're not going to have any choice where we go. For example, if we look at our test input, starting from here all the way until this point here is the first position at which we actually get a choice of which direction to go. So what we're going to do is a technique called path, um, sorry, edge contraction. So edge contraction, essentially what it means is in a graph, if we have a bunch of nodes of degree two, so in other words, they have two edges coming out of them. Let's say we have a graph that looks something like this, and we're trying to pathfind a way to get from the start to the end. If we have a bunch of these nodes of degree two, then we can delete those nodes and just reconnect around them. And so for each of these nodes of length two, we're just going to connect an edge through them to our destination. And so in these examples here, we can get rid of a couple of nodes. And if there are more than two nodes of degree two in a row, we can get rid of all of them. And so this redraws our graph to look like this. which means that we have fewer things to pathfind through. And this is especially important for the longest path. With shortest path, this actually doesn't accomplish anything. But with longest path, longest path requires some amount of brute forcing. And so we want to reduce the number of nodes as much as possible. So let's first identify a list of these crossroads points, we'll call them. So let's first grab our grid. And now we'll find the start and end points. So start, it's always in the top row and it's going to be the singular point. So grid zero dot index of dot. And the end is the in the bottom row. So we'll take the last row of grid and find the dot. So the start and end will be two points of interest. So they're at zero one and 22, 21 respectively. And now we'll look for any point such that at least three of its neighbors are not pound are yeah are not pound signs. So for each point, if it's a pound sign itself, then we'll continue. We'll skip it. Otherwise, we'll look at the number of neighbors. So for each adjacent uh, neighbor row and column. see if it is in bounds and not a pound sign, then it is a neighbor. So neighbors plus equals one. And now if the number of neighbors is at least three, then it's a point of interest. So we'll add it to a points list. So points.append rc. So now we have a list of points 
for which there are at least three neighbors. And basically what we want to do is we want to reconstruct this grid as a graph just consisting of these points. And for each pair of points that can be reached without going through any other points of interest, we can just draw an edge of that length. So instead of having 15 individual dots here, we're just going to draw a singular edge from this point to this point of length 15, because there is no other path to get between those two points. If we run this on the real input, we see that the number of points is only 36, which is still going to take a while for our final runtime because longest path is simply slow, but this at least proves to us that it's feasible. So now we're going to want to do the actual contraction part. So we're going to need to obtain the underlying graph. The graph begins as each point pointing to an empty dictionary, where this diction basically this is going to be an adjacency list. So for each point, we will get a dictionary telling us for each neighbor how far away it is. And we'll only want to connect neighbors that are quote unquote directly adjacent. So in other words, if we have a situation where these points connect together, we do not want to draw this edge. The reason we don't want to draw this edge is if we then drew this edge as well, then we might say that to get from this point to this point, we could take this path, but that would be invalid because of this duplication and we don't want to step on the same tile twice. So we only want to connect directly adjacent crossroads. The way we're going to do this is starting from each crossroad, we're just going to flood outwards. And each time we see a point of interest, we'll just stop propagating. And that way we will only look at things that can be reached without crossing through any other intersections. Since we're forming a directed graph here, this is also where we will apply these slopes. So each time we see a slope, if, we, if we're going the wrong direction, we'll just ignore it. And so that way we make sure that we only draw edges that are in the correct direction. So for example, from this point to this point, we would have an edge of length 15, but there would not be an edge the other way. So now let's define our fill function, or actually we don't need a function, we can just loop. We also don't need to do it breadth first, we can do it depth first. And so we don't even need to import Q, we'll just use a stack, which you can do with the default Python list. So for each point, we'll begin our stack as a list containing PT, and we'll maintain a scene set to avoid backtracking. So now while PT, so while stack is true, we have RC equals stack.pop, um, also, we need to store the distance. So nrc is stack.pop. And then we'll look uh, if rc is in, if rc is a point of interest. So if, let's call this sr and sc for starting row and column. So if this current position is, there's a better way for this. If the current position is the starting position, then we don't want to add it as an edge because we don't want an edge pointing from each node to itself. And we also don't want to stop propagation here. So if it's not in the starting position and it is in points, then it is one of the points of interest. And so we add it to the graph. So graph a starting row and starting column going to row column is equal to n. And likewise, the same goes, sorry, we don't want to add the same the other direction because our graph will be directed. So this says that our graph has a point from the starting row and column position to this new RC position that we've found. And then we continue to stop propagating forward. Now we go through each of its neighbors. So for nrnc in actually drdc in directions. And here's what we'll, where we will apply our slopes. So we will create a dirs dictionary that will point from each possible character to the list of valid directions. So we will access grid rc to get the character. And then here we'll define dirs. So if we have a caret, it points up so we can only go up. If it's a V, we can only go down. If it's a leftward angle bracket, we can only go 
left. And if it's a right angle bracket, we can only go right. If it's a dot, then we can just go in any of those directions. There. So now for each valid direction, we'll say nr is equal to r plus dr and nc is c plus dc. So if we basically want to copy these, um, this, these conditions, we could extract them to a function, but I'm not going to go through the effort. So if it's in range and it's not a pound sign, and also it's not been seen yet, then we will add it to the stack and we'll increase the step count by one and we'll add it to scene. Oh yeah, and n starts at zero. I've been using too much JavaScript. Okay, and so this gives us our graph. So from the end position, we can't reach anything because of these slopes. We can only go towards the end. We can't go back once we've uh, gone here. Starting from the beginning position, we have an edge of length 15 going to the first crossroads here, which is 0.53. If we find 5.3 in the dictionary as a key, we can see that it points to 3.11 and 13.5, which starting from here would be somewhere down here and somewhere over here. So those are the two points that we are able to reach. And now we basically just brute force every possible path. So longest path is not solvable in an efficient, like there's no efficient algorithm to get the longest path. The only way to do it is basically to just go through every possibility. And so, we will define a DFS function. And so if we define DFS, we'll do this recursively because there are only 40 points. And since we can't revisit anything, at most that the recursion depth of 40 is easily reachable. Python by default goes up to 1,000, but you can even increase that if you want. So we'll take in a point, which at the beginning will be start, and then We'll keep track of our scene state using a global set. So we'll do scene equals set. This is a trick that Nikki brought up in my Discord server that does help with the optimization a bit. Instead of storing the scene as the argument and then copying it down to each recursive call of the function, that would be a bit slower because we need to do a lot of data copying. If we do it globally, then we can maintain the state via backtracking. I'll show you that in a bit. Uh, I think the global scene is not actually strictly necessary here. So now if the point is the end, then we just return zero. So once we've reached the end, we return a travel length of zero. Otherwise, we were looking for the maximum length. So we'll start with a maximum of negative infinity. What this means is that if we don't find a path to the end, then we'll return negative infinity, indicating there's no path. And so we, when we take the maximum of everything, it will just get ignored. We could also do zero, I suppose. It, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. Um, but by doing negative infinity, this also means that we can just directly add our DFS result recursively, uh, which I'll demonstrate in a bit. So now for each next point, I'll call it NX, in the graph for PT. So remember that graph PT is a dictionary pointing to each node that can be visited from PT with the values being the distance. And then we can say m is the maximum of itself with dfs from nx plus the length to that. So we're essentially saying for each edge that goes out from pt, try starting from the next node and then going to the end. And then once we find that distance, we will add the edge that we took as our first step. Now, the reason negative infinity helps is because once we return m, if we found no path here, we return negative infinity. And so if we return negative infinity from here, when we add it here, we just get negative infinity again. And so even if there are edges going out from the graph, if all of them cannot find the endpoint, then we'll just get a final answer of negative infinity here. And now to add the scene state to avoid uh, creating cycles, we will do scene.addPT here and then scene.removePT here. What this means is that within this call, 
PT has already been seen, so we avoid backtracking. But once we step out of this function, we don't want to be blocking PT anymore because we might find a different path to get to it. And so we could just DFS from the start now, and that gives us our answer for part one. So 94 steps for the test and 2010 steps for my puzzle answer. Now this can be brute forced more directly. So you can skip the edge contraction part and actually just directly brute force it because the slopes here prevent enough backtracking and narrow down the search space by enough that it will actually finish in a pretty reasonable amount of time. However, for part two, this is probably fairly easy to predict, but basically we're just going to discard the slopes. We realize the ground isn't that slippery, We'll have no problem climbing up the slopes, and so we just treat all the slopes as normal paths. And so this is actually also brute forceable. Apparently some people were able to brute force it before they were able to find a better solution, but you'd probably have to be using a faster language. I'm not certain if it's possible in Python within a reasonable amount of time. It may still be, I haven't tried it. But for our implementation, this is actually really easy. We just take this, remove it out here, and then we just do that. So now instead of checking the directions based on the slope, we just check all directions always. Um, okay, so that's obviously not supposed to happen. Let's figure out where the error lies. So if we print out the length of points, and then exit, Okay, so the length of points is still correct. If we print our graph, that also still looks valid. Ah, yes, I see. Funnily enough, the problem is actually that we're not ever checking if the point is in scene. So we actually weren't preventing cycles in the first part. It just so happens that there are no cycles in the first part. And so that's why brute force works, because there just are no cycles in the first part because of the slope. So now if we run this, it'll take a bit, but we do eventually get our answer for part two. That runs for approximately 20 seconds. I just skipped it for you. So yeah, today's problem, although the one wide thing is a bit of an assumption, really the edge contraction algorithm works in general. It's just that if we had two wide paths, then we'd get a bunch of these cons like crossroad intersections. So let's suppose we had a setup like this. Then all of these points would be would have more than two neighbors, and so they would all be considered to be interesting point like uh, crossroad points. And so we could do a bit of edge contraction here, for example, but these middle paths would not be able to be contracted at all. And so if we had too many of these. Uh, intersection points, this algorithm would not be able to complete in a reasonable amount of time. But assumptions about the size of the input, I suppose, are sort of valid to make. In any case, that's all for today's video. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed.